Chile had been calm in the 1960s. Washington's Alliance for Progress program spent millions of dollars backing Chile's Christian Democrat government. But in 1970, a coalition of the left and the center sought electoral victory. Unidad Popular was led by a doctor, Freemason, and Marxist bon vivant, Senator Salvador Allende. Uh, Allende was uh, depicted and, and, and identified uh, with the socialist communist parties, the left, uh, in the midst of the Cold War, and he represented, of course, uh, socialism and Marxism. Worried that a Marxist would come to power in legitimate elections, U.S. business made its move. I directed that an approach be made to both the State Department and Mr. Kissinger's office to tell them that we had grave concern over the outlook for ITT's investment, and we were desirous of discussing our thoughts in Washington and willing to assist financially in any government plan to help protect private American investment in Chile. The CIA was not far behind. General René Schneider, the popular army commander who defended Allende's constitutional rights, had to be removed from his post. The CIA gave me $250,000 to use right who was the military, who count on to come and help us maybe get rid of Snyder. That was the key, get rid of Snyder. Well, I couldn't put my office safe because everybody used to say, so I kept my riding boots. The money was done up in the sausages, like in long strips, and I kept the money in my, in my riding boot, and no one used it for me. The CIA money dispatched to oust General Schneider wasn't needed. Other plotters assassinated him. The murder shocked the nation. Moderate politicians rallied to Allende and consolidated his election victory. In the shanty towns of Chile, there were high hopes as the newly elected president set out on reform, without, he hoped, outside interference. Que los Estados Unidos tienen que respetar el derecho de los pueblos a desarrollar su economía en la forma que, que necesita o desea. Allende's first big step, supported by all Chilean political parties, was the nationalization of copper, Chile's biggest industry, still under effective U.S. control. Cuando Salvador Allende when Salvador Allende nationalized no copper, it wasn't an arbitrary measure. He did it to obtain the resources to alleviate the great poverty in our country. Allende pressed on with what he called his social revolution. School children were given a daily glass of milk the middle classes were on edge. The fear was basically what would happen to uh, the people, to the families, uh, uh, to uh, the property, to uh, your farms. In the Chilean countryside, peasants chanting pro-Cuban slogans began seizing the land. What happened afterwards confirmed the fears because the government, uh, on the one hand, started to expropriate um, land, started to expropriate industry. Chile's economy was increasingly put under state control. This upset foreign financiers and the World Bank in Washington, which cut off credits. Chile, of course, is interested in uh uh, obtaining uh, loans uh, from uh, international organizations where we have a vote. Uh, and I indicated that uh, wherever we had a vote, uh, where Chile was involved, that uh, unless there were strong considerations on the other side, that we would vote against them. In November 1971, Fidel Castro arrived to support Allende's policy of change through the ballot box. 
We fully supported his policy. We trained people for his personal security. We were experienced in this because we had had to defend ourselves against those who wanted to destroy us. We told him about this because we thought he had enemies who might try to take his life. The dangers didn't just come from the right. Castro's Cuban policy of armed revolution found favor with Chile's extreme left, who were hostile to Allende's methods. But most Chileans ignored the call to armed struggle. As inflation mounted, the right attacked economically. CIA money helped pay for Chilean truck owners to bring the country to a standstill. At the UN, Allende accused ITT of trying to provoke a civil war. Se proponía el estrangulamiento económico, el sabotaje diplomático, el desorden social, crear el pánico en la población para que al ser sobrepasado el gobierno Las Fuerzas Armadas fueran impulsadas a quebrar el régimen democrático e imponer una dictadura. Moscow was the next stop. There, Allende sought the money he needed to stave off bankruptcy. But the Russians, already spending a fortune to support Cuba, were unimpressed. We had come to a conclusion. This regime would soon be toppled. Because they were trying through very democratic means, without the use of arms, to break the resistance of stronger opposition forces. Santiago, Chile's capital, June 1973. With the government's popularity actually increasing, some frustrated right-wing military officers took to the streets in an attempted coup. As the world's press recorded the failed takeover, Swedish cameraman Leonardo Hendrickson, his camera still running, was gunned down and killed. Allende responded by placing greater reliance on the military. General Augusto Pinochet was appointed as his loyal chief of the army. Once again, the truck owners paralyzed the world's longest and thinnest country. Shops closed for lack of goods. Hunger stalked the streets. Middle-class housewives came out to bang their pots and pans in protest. The violent right laid their plots. Certainly the situation was, was getting more and more ominous. And then uh, we, we did have the possibility of learning something about it, not because we were in touch with the coup plotters. We, we were not. Just after midday on Tuesday the 11th of September, under orders from General Pinochet, British-made hunter jets swooped over the Moneda Presidential Palace, starting fires which were to burn for weeks. My wife and our children were at the house, and they had a marvelous view of, the, uh, of these planes uh, winging over and then dipping down and, and sending their bombs into the Moneda. That morning from the Moneda, Allende had broadcast to the nation. Viva Chile! Viva el pueblo! Vivan los trabajadores! Hours later, 
Allende was dead. He always said that he wouldn't be taken alive, that he would die defending the Constitution. He kept his word. General Pinochet immediately stamped his mark on the country. In the capital, suspects were rounded up into the national stadium. Many, like folk singer Victor Hara, were never seen alive again. I know that he behaved with great moral courage. I know that he was a sort of source of strength to his fellow prisoners. I know that he sang there. I know that they beat him down. I know that they broke his hands or his wrists. And I know that after two days, they killed him off. The people he got rid of and shot out of the, uh, uh, the stadium were all bad people. I mean, he was smart enough to know that he was going to do it. You had to do it complete 100%. You just can't go into it half ass, excuse me, and uh, do a little bit here and a little bit here. He went in with a lot of force and did it. And straight it out.